been doing this for a while. I <laughs> can't see anything anymore. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure to be here today. And um, I, I'm really passionate about land trusts and um, about private property and the importance that uh, the role that private property and the importance that land trusts can provide for um, for all of our quality of life that we enjoy in the Carolinas. It's it's so important. And you know what I'm what I'm going to talk to you about today is the, is the importance not just of a culture or of people of hum, the human race or or our nation, but the importance that every single person. Every single one of us, the importance of every single person to the natural world. Um, and it's really easy sometimes to feel overburdened by what's going on uh, in the world and feel like you make no difference. You do. People can make a huge difference. What is my grandmother reading to me out of the Manual of Vascular Flora of the Carolinas? She, I, I used to get in trouble for saying the common names. So I have a problem with common names. You know, like when, when she sent me looking for trillium, she'd pay me a quarter for every trillium I could put a little flag next to on our, our property in the mountains. But I had to come back and report on whether it was trillium undulatum, trillium sulcatum, or trillium erectum. If I said Wake Robin, it wasn't good enough. I didn't get my quarter. Okay? So, um, she had a huge uh, impact, um, not, not because she was um, just encouraging and protecting uh, land, but um, because she influenced me. Um, if you don't believe that, that a single person can have an impact, you can look at my grandmother, look at the strict and the wonderful um, gift that they've given the world here, which is, is just awe-inspiring. I've never been to this place until today, and I can tell you just driving in, just the just sheer look and the beauty of that this place is it just gave me goosebumps off the bat. And then to come in and see the wonderful things that are going around uh, the, and the energy around this place, just incredible. So thank you so much for that, that wonderful gift. Um, so personal space, how important are we? I'm also the director of the South Carolina Botanical Garden and the, and the Bob Campbell Geology Museum, and they give me lots of titles. And, and each one involves about 80 hours a week. So my <laughs> wife will tell you. <laughs> I do everything except sleep, but, and occasionally she takes me to get a haircut. Um, like I said, a lot of things going on in the world, and most of us who are in this room are concerned about these, these major issues um, that, that really confront us um, on a global scale. Uh, that we're just we're slammed with all the time, you know, from from massive droughts, changing climate. You know, uh, we kind of in this room we're just kind of accept that climate change happens, and we're not going to talk about where it came from because we don't bring up the politi politicized end, but we bring up the reality that that uh, you know what climate changes has changed in the pl in the past. If you don't believe climate change happens, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> As, you know, that's why there's no woolly mammoths or saber-toothed cats around and, and why, you know, we know New York was under two kilometers of ice 18,000 years ago. That's not a guess. It happened. And why is it not there anymore? It's because of climate change. So, you know, I'm, I, one of the things I think is our biggest challenge as a society, more so in the United States than anywhere else in the world, is the divisions that separate us these days. Now, if, if I could work to, to change one thing, it would be to, to get rid of the divisions. Um, and to, to, for us to realize that it's a heck of a lot more important to focus on the things we actually can do something about together than it is to spend so much time tearing each other down. All right, so that's, that's so important. Um, and climate change is one of those issues where we can do it. So anyway, how important are we and how important are our backyards? That's, that's kind of what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at a couple examples that are on a really big scale, and then we're going to bring it back into like a really small scale about how important each one of our backyards are. But, you know, your personal space, your private property, um, just like the botanical gardens, um, and we, both of us, whether you're in South Carolina or North Carolina, we have two wonderful state botanical gardens that both believe in the same thing, which is that a botanical garden, our mission is really to, to illustrate to people the sense of empowerment that you can have um, from looking at man's influence both ways, how much we get from the natural world and how much the natural world depends on us. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. My, my motto at the South Carolina Botanical Garden kind of is throw down a shell and change the world. We'll talk more about that later. Um, speaking of personal choices and how much they can impact our diversity and our quality of life, how many people hate butterflies in this room? <laughs> right? Even if you do, you're scared to raise your hand at this point. Right? Well, um, 
talk about a powerful cat catalyst to discuss the importance of personal space. The news that's been going on right now about what has happened in the past couple years in Mexico has caused this knee-jerk reaction where all of a sudden we're like, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on? We can't possibly lose one of the most charismatic and important species of butterfly to, to the human race on the, I mean, monarchs, for goodness sake. It's not just, a, monarchs aren't just found in the eastern United States. Monarchs aren't just found in North America. They're, they're really a worldwide butterfly. But our monarchs um, all migrate to this one place, a couple valleys in Mexico, Mexico, the, the most famous um, El Rosario, where that picture was taken, are home to millions of butterflies in the wintertime. You know, it's not just the same butterfly that you see hatch out uh, of, a, of a chrysalis here. It isn't exactly the same butterfly that makes it to Mexico because they go through several successive generations uh, you know, on the way here. And then on the way back, you have a super generation, right, uh, which is there that, that, that makes the trip all the way to the Valley of Mexico from near the, near the border of the United States, overwinters and then breeds and, and those successive generations come back. So we're talking about multiple generations. It's not like a bird where the bird flies back and forth many times. A single monarch will never make both directional trips there and back. But that, that incredible importance that Valley of Mexico to these butterflies means that what happens in El Rosario is going to determine whether or not we have butterflies in our backyard, monarchs in our backyard. And we all learned in third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, depending on which state you grew up in, it's all part of the curriculum. You all learned about life cycles and kept those monarchs, right, on milkweed and watched them transform. And what a wonderful thing and, and resource for students. And the reason why I think it's connected to a lot of us uh, very intensely. And of course, in 1996 to 1997, there was about 18 hectares of butterflies. That's, I don't know, 39 or so acres. Um, and now in 13 and 14, last winter, there was only less than a half, or less than, um, than 0.6, it was 0.56 hectares of monarchs. So they've just gone in the dumps. And the good news is a lot of effort this year going into uh, this, these projects working with monarchs and, and planting things like lots and lots of milkweed has resulted in already uh, a much larger population at returning to Mexico. The first ones got there on November 2nd. If you're part of Monarch Watch, like I am, you know that November 2nd, the first butterflies got back and already we it looks like we have a slight uptick from last year, but they're still in big trouble. And they're in big trouble not because the Mexicans haven't protected El Rosario because those people who live around El Rosario make all of their money from people like you and me going to El Rosario to see those butterflies in December and January. But it's what's happening here that's really changed that. And it's a change in the style for which we're managing our property, managing our land, particularly in places like Oklahoma and Texas, Arkansas and Kansas. States that these monarch butterflies have to go through that are almost entirely agriculturalized. And the type of agriculture we have today has, has eliminated a, a sizable patch of milkweed, pretty sizable, one about the size of the state of Indiana has been eliminated. 24 million acres of weedy area in between row crop fields of soybean, cotton, rice have been eliminated because now we plant all those crops as genetically modified organisms that can withstand Roundup, which means we don't have as messy a field. There's not as many uh, uh, weeds around, which consequently means there's not as much milkweed around. And when there's not as much milkweed around, the generations of butterfly that have to make it through that region and have to breed have nowhere to lay their eggs. So the, this is a bad thing, but it's also something that every, each and every one of us can do something about. Throughout the range of milkweeds, we're losing milkweeds because we're not just losing those kind of weedy areas, but we're losing early successional habitat. And so planting milkweeds in your backyard particularly if you guys know anybody in central or northern Texas or Oklahoma or Kansas, <laughs> encourage them to plant milkweeds in the backyard. And this, I mean, I mean, we have planted millions and millions of milkweeds this year. Literally, this has been, we cannot keep a milkweed at the South Carolina Botanical Garden because so many people want to buy them this year because everybody has heard about this and heard how every person can make a difference in providing that critical pathway 
back and forth from Mexico. And you know, it looks like it may actually be happening. So we all learned kind of on that, that milkweed in the first slide, which believe it or not, I took that picture in Polk County. I just thought about that um, when I stuck it up there right on my way. I used to drive back to Wilkesboro, come up to 74 through uh, Columbus there and uh, go up to my mom's house that way. And right along 74 is a wonderful patch of milkweed right after you turn out of Columbus where I took that picture. But there's numerous species, you know. So planting milkweed, um, uh, all of the species of milkweed are food for, for monarchs. So a pretty easy thing to do. <laughs> um, I'm going to cage most of my talk on, on talking about migra migration. Uh, and of course, the animals we think of as migratory perhaps more than any other are birds. And I'll be honest with you, um, I wasn't a big fan of birds to begin with in my career. Um, now I'm known as the bird guy. Uh, but I'm a botanist. And really, birds kind of had to come to me for me to really get it. You know, um, this is a beautiful Florida scrub jay, which is about as non-migratory as you get. A Florida, Florida scrub jays uh, will spend their whole life in about a, a two-hectare size parcel of property, so they're, they're not very much world travelers, but a lot of birds are. But what I love about birds, two things, um, and what really caught me and, and attracted me to birds are really two things. Birds, uh, A, uh, are, are often migratory, and they're great sentinels of the health of our ecosystems. And small changes in the way we use land represent themselves in rapid and very dramatic changes in the bird populations that we see. Um, and the fact they're migratory is a lot of them moving from pole to pole, like the Arctic tern moves from, from pole to pole during the year. So what is the habit of the Arctic tern? Everything in the entire world, right? So if you like Arctic terns being part of your natural heritage, well then you better be concerned about what goes on off the coast of Antarctica as much as you are concerned about what goes on in Barrow, Alaska, as much as you are concerned about the nutrient discharge from the Carolinas out into the Atlantic Ocean. It pulls together the whole world because they're migratory. Second thing I love about birds is, again, just like monarch butterflies, how many people hate birds? <laughs> Depends on the bird. OK, you got a bird you don't like. What is the, what is the bird you don't like? Starlings. Starlings. Is there any other birds you don't like? Grackles. Grackles. English sparrows. English sparrows. Brown-headed cowbird. I'm so glad you said that. We're going to talk about brown-headed cowbirds a little bit. <laughs> kind of interesting. So what I love about this is I, I really like to challenge people on my show without them even knowing they're being challenged. You know, so uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about things that um, for for my neighbor Lindsey Graham who, down in Pendleton, uh, he would get slammed uh, for talking about and did get slammed for talking about cap and trade and and controlling carbon emissions um, back in a couple years ago and and totally changed his platform on it because of it. Um, we get slammed talking about this in the political arena, but I can get away with it because I don't politicize it and I sneak it in there using birds, right? So here's a great example of that. Um, these are parrots, obviously, and where I took the picture of the parrots is really kind of interesting. The one on the left is a red crown parrot, the one on the right, that beautiful couple, that is a green parakeet, which is actually a type of small macaw. It's actually bigger than the, uh, the red uh, crowned Amazon that's on the left. And both of those were taken in Brownsville, Texas. And both of those attract tens of thousands of crazed birders like myself to go to Brownsville and go to this park, downtown park in the middle of Brownsville, entirely rough Latino neighborhood that we go to to, to see these parrots come into these, um, into these eucalyptus trees. And we go there because they count as native birds for the United States and we get to check them off of our, our checklist. <laughs> and they're freaking parrots. I mean, it's pretty cool. Parrots are neat to see. Um, so, the neat thought about these parrots is the story behind the parrots, and it involves change and choice in people's backyards in Brownsville. It's kind of an interesting one. Um, there are actually nine species of parrots that live in Brownsville, um, but most of those parrots are escaped cage birds. Most of them uh, have escaped because people were smuggling them into the United States when they're crossing illegally, and they get caught and they cut open the cages, and they don't want to get caught with endangered species. So lilac crowned Amazons and white uh, crowned Amazons and yellow fronted. You have the whole slew of of parrots that have established themselves in these cities in South Texas because of being released cage birds. These two are not released cage birds. These two birds moved on their own into Brownsville from adjacent Tamaulipas, Mexico. 
And the reason they did it is kind of interesting because back in the 70s, Tamaulipas, right along the Rio Grande, that's south, you know, the northeasternmost state in Mexico, um, went through an agricultural revolution and they cut down basically every single tree in Tamaulipas to put in massive agricultural um, you know, activities. This is where most of your tomatoes that are purchased in the wintertime come from. If they're Mexican tomatoes, they're coming from these farms along the Rio Grande near Tamaulipas. Um, and as a consequence, cavity nesting birds like these parrots that take over the cavities of woodpeckers, um, their nest sites became basically non-existent. Now these birds can live 60 or 70 years. So they lasted quite a while without having a place to breed, looking and looking for somewhere to breed. Same time they were agriculturalizing Tamaulipas, we were also shipping as many people from Ohio and Michigan and the Midwest down to Harlingen, McAllen, and Brownsville to retire as possible. And in the process, they moved to, <laughs> they moved to these wonderful places, this wonderful climate where um, they wanted to have a palm tree. Everyone planted. Everyone planted this Washingtonia palm, and in 1982, there was a massive frost that killed most of the Washingtonias in Brownsville, Harlingen, and McAllen. Well, when the palms died in their yard, a lot of people didn't really take them out, and a woodpecker came and made a nest in it. You don't want to take the, the tree down when a woodpecker has a nest in it because we all love birds, so they left that tree, planted a new palm, and right after the next year, in 1983, the very first red crown parrots and green parakeets showed up in McAllen, Harlingen, and Brownsville simultaneously to take advantage of those cavities that were in the trees in those, in those border towns. And today, we will drive or fly to Brownsville to see these and check them off our list, and we're so happy to have them. And what are they? They're illegal immigrants who crossed the Rio Grande. <laughs> to make a better future for their families. <laughs> so, pretty cool, isn't it? It's pretty interesting how our, our opinions, and you have no idea how many people I've taken to Texas who, who just can't stand Mexican immigrants that, that have gone to see these birds. <laughs> And as you're standing in this wonderful neighborhood in Brownsville, um, and Brownsville is, is an entirely uh, Latino uh, community today, and as you're standing there and the people are coming up and talking to you about the parrots and they're, they're speaking English, they're not speaking Spanish to you, and it really can be a life changer um, for people just to be associated with birds. So um, it's a neat little story, um, but this one's right in our backyard here, and it's something I really want us to think about today, which is what is natural. We just looked at an example of, of humans interacting with parrots and changing their natural distribution. But what is natural for us here? Um, and I'm going to use an, an, an example from right in this area, the, the upstate of North Carolina, of South Carolina, and the adjacent Piedmont slash um, mountain interchange, this sort of upper Piedmont belt of our two states is a great example. Um, when we think of the natural habitat, out there in the uplands, in the dry areas away from the, the, the steep slopes and the coves along streams. When we think about the land that we live on, the places we make our homes, and we think about what is natural out there. If I was to describe what's natural, it would probably be something like our backyard. You know, oaks, hickories, pines, tulip poplars, sweet gums in this forest that we can't wait to get away from so we can get up to the mountains and see forests that have lots of wildflowers in them because ours tend to be pretty depauperate in terms of what is going on underneath that dense um, layer of loblolly pine soaks and, uh, and hickories. So oak hickory forest is what we think of as natural on our uplands. Um, and I I'm going to kind of challenge you to, to maybe rethink what natural is today um, by telling you the story of how we got there. Um, and it's going to be told around um, birds. So if this will work, kick in, kick in. There you go. Show you three, um, three types of birds that either come through the Carolinas or make their home here. Um, and they represent three different ecological guilds. This bird is, of course, a Baltimore Oriole, one of the most beautiful black birds on the planet. Believe it or not, you don't like grackles, but you like Baltimore Orioles just because they're orange. <laughs> Um, and this bird loves backyards, open habitats, savannas. The, the chat 
is a great example of what we call an early successional bird. This is a bird you go to power lines, clear cuts, old fields to find that bird, um, places that people have really messed up. The oven bird, which I really regret I don't have a song on here because he ain't the world's most beautiful bird, but he has one of the most uh, intense songs of any of our birds. Oven birds, and because he's not quite as flashy, I'll show you a really flashy one here, the scarlet tanager, um, are examples, two species of birds that are examples of birds that need extensive blocks of 80 year old or older forest um, to successfully breed. Matter of fact, oven birds need 280 consecutive acres uninterrupted even by a paved road of 80 plus year old trees to successfully raise one nest of young. They've been heavily studied up in New England um, and even though we haven't studied it heavily here, you see the same, you see this easily the same uh, pattern here where if you want to see an oven bird, you go to older forests. If you want to see a scarlet tanager, you go to older forests. And the reason this oven bird has to have such a huge block of land of old growth forest really to, to, to breed is because they make their nests on the ground in this little nest that looks like an oven. That's how they get their name, like a pizza oven. Okay? And because it's a ground nesting bird, any predator in the world can walk up to it and eat the babies. And so nesting in the center of the forest takes you away from the cruising range of things like those koi dogs <laughs> and, um, and foxes and raccoons and predators which tend to patrol the edges of forests because that's higher productivity habitat. There's more food there. So the males that are at the center of forest patches are more successful in courting females because their nests that they build are less predated. Okay, safer place to build your nest. The um, beautiful uh, scarlet tanager needs about 100 to 120 acres of contiguous forest breed. So anyway, there's three different groups. One that likes backyards, one that likes um, clear cuts and um, um, cow fields, old pastures, old fields like that, and then um, our old growth forest. So here's your quiz. Uh, which group of birds, ecological guild, we call them in the, in the conservation community, which one of those ecological guilds do you think is doing the worst? Which ones are in the most, most trouble? How many, how many people think it's the uh, backyard bird? Okay, okay good for you. Uh, how many of you guys think it's the clear cut bird? Okay, how many old growth forest? Okay, okay. oh, you're all wrong. Oh, goodness. You're all wrong. It's, it's birds like the eastern meadowlark. Um, it's the early successional birds, birds that need clear cuts, that need old power lines, that need cow fields are the birds that are in the biggest trouble, not just here in the eastern United States, but worldwide. Matter of fact, eastern meadowlarks have underwent a decline of 90% of their population level in the last 50 years alone. This is a bird we're very worried about. It's still considered a G5. It's still a common bird, but we're really worried about it because every single year on the Christmas counts, our numbers of meadowlarks continue to plummet just exponentially. And in the county I grew up in, in Allegheny County, North Carolina, um, this was the most common sound in the spring to me. When, and I knew it was spring when I heard that incredible noise, the, the sound that the meadowlark makes. It's one of the most beautiful. It's another black bird that you love, by the way, uh, because it's not black. Um, but the eastern meadowlark um, it was common in my county because we had uh, almost the entire county was dairy farms when I grew up. There's one active dairy in Allegheny County today. And instead of, instead of growing cows, we grow uh, just like many other places like Harlingen, we grow retirees and Christmas trees today. <laughs> Turns out to be a lot less work, a lot less labor intensive. Um, and. Uh, as a consequence of our shifting our patterns, we've seen a shift in the natural diversity of native birds that we are able to enjoy. Um, so it's, it's, it's you know, interesting, if I, if, why is this the case? Why are grassland birds so endangered today? It's because we're losing grasslands faster than any other habitat on Earth. Because grasslands in our neck of the woods really require the human touch to be maintained. And we can see this. Um, when we really look at man's hand as a force of change, um, and man is being part of nature rather than being a part from it. So this is a view, I love this view, looking out from Glassy Mountain in Pickens County, um, of you know, all of the perturbations that we've made as you look up towards the Blue Ridge Escarpment where we sit right now today. Um, this is looking right up towards us from Pickens County, South Carolina, um, up into the beautiful blue wall, we call it, in South Carolina. And you look at all the things people have done in the foreground of that picture and you think, wow, we really messed things up. But a matter of fact, those, 
those activities have been going on here for quite a while. Quite a while. The world did not start to be changed by man here in, in, North, in the Carolinas um, with the founding of Charleston, even though they'd like you to think that in Charleston. Um, it's been going on for a long, long time. And here's a good example, a cowbird, right? Well, we hate cowbirds. Why do we hate cowbirds? They do. They have this wonderful behavior called brood parasitism. Oh, we hate them for that. I, I've seen, uh, I do this Wild Acres retreat thing each spring for up at, uh, in Little Switzerland. I just love it. We always do a, a bird walk as part of that, uh, that. If you don't go to the Wild Acres retreat, you should find out about it. It's a great weekend um, to take families and really just experiencing everything there is to experience right there on the Blue Ridge Escarpment, uh, nature out there. And, you know, we walk along that trail and last, or year before last, I was doing my bird walk out there and we had a lovely pair of Blackburnian warblers that were coming back and forth feeding their young. And these little Blackburnian warblers, these hot orange and black, beautiful, one of, probably my favorite warbler that we have in the Appalachians, uh, little bitty birds like this were feeding a great big, <laughs> ugly brown cowbird. And that's why we don't like them. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. And we think of them as non-native birds in South Carolina. Because um, they, of course, we all know, invaded South Carolina in the 1950s through the 70s. And when they came in, they completely changed the, the diversity of birds around us. They lowered populations of things like song sparrows and Blackburnian warblers. But we have to challenge this with some research that I'm doing in conjunction with the, um, the Natural History Museum London, the Jardin de Plantes in France, and Furman University, um, supported by the Mellon Foundation, we're actually going through and we're looking at all of the collections and the writings and the letters that the early colonial botanists uh, made uh, when, they, when Europeans were colonizing the Carolinas. They were at the same time shipping back thousands and thousands of artifacts. And the, some of the most uh, esteemed artifacts they shipped back were things like plants and birds. And this is the very first image ever made of a brown-headed cowbird, which Mark Catesby called the cowpen bird. And that bird was, that image was made from a bird that he saw in Charleston, South Carolina in, in 1723. So are, are cowbirds native to South Carolina? Apparently so. Apparently so. And we're finding lots of things in our studies of Mark Catesby that tells us. My wife would tell you I have a, a man crush on Mark Catesby, and she's, she's pretty right. I mean, the guy was like, he, he's been dead 300 years, so we're safe, we're all good. But um, Mark Catesby uh, was a really observant guy. He came to the New World in 1712 to visit his sister, who was a Virginia colony, but he came to South Carolina, came back to the New World in 1723 as, a, as sort of a seasoned naturalist to really observe and describe and send back to England everything he could find for a couple of wealthy guys, one at Oxford and one in London, uh, Hans Sloan and a guy named Delinius. And so when he was sending uh, specimens back, he was also drawing and, and recording lots of information on what South Carolina was like in the 1720s. And this guy was double tough, man. He walked twice from Charleston to Clemson. 1723 and 1724, once in the spring, once in the fall when European habitation only extended 60 miles inland from the coast. So he was spending most of his time in what was then Indian territories. And he was finding lots of things like cowbirds um, that we wouldn't think of being in, the, in South Carolina for many, many years. And the reason the cowbirds were here is because buffalo, buffalo were here. So this, this brood parasitism is actually an incredible adaptation to making your living around a large ungulate, the bison. American bison, which is continually moving, never sits still, always migratory, always transient. And if you're getting your shade, your perch, your food, all from the activities of a bison, you have to follow them. And if you're following them every day, you don't have time to stop and raise young. So they, they develop this wonderful adaptation of laying their eggs in the nest of another bird and then moving on with the bison. Yeah? So pretty cool. That's why they do it, right? Now, how many buffalo do we have in Polk County, North Carolina today? Some. Yeah, we've got, we're actually bringing them back in, as, in a major way on some farms. 
But in general, we don't think about bison as being a native animal in North Carolina and South Carolina, but it was native to both. Um, and matter of fact, Mark Catesby, there's a wonderful letter he wrote back to, to Hans Sloan saying how tired he was of eating elk and bison on his trips to Clem up to Clemson uh, before Clemson existed because all his Cherokee guides would do was, would, hunt, would be to hunt bison and elk. And he was like, I'd, I'd give anything for a brace of coney uh, because he was so tired of eating bison and nothing else. And we think of that as very strange, but in fact, um, this guy was documenting not just the, the animals but the plants and, and they're totally different from what we think of today. He was like me, he was a botanist, so he, he drew the bison but his uh, words actually are about the tree because the buffalo was just a buffalo and the tree 